Hi, I'm Dr. Joshua Sappenfield. I'm a clinical assistant professor here at the Department of Anesthesiology, University of Florida. And I'm the current uh, director for the anesthesia um, slash airway management rotation. I'm going to talk to you about how to uh, perform basic skills in airway management. The first thing I want to talk about is positioning the patient. Uh, this is very important. In fact, 90% of success to manage the airway is uh, preparation and positioning. First, you want to have your airway equipment such that you can reach it and the patient at the same time. So, usually I have the bed in such a way that I comfortably reach my airway equipment and the patient and any medications or additional supplies that I may need. Second, the bed uh, should be in such a position that the patient's head is between your navel and your sternal notch. Uh, this is because you're looking down the patient's uh, throat towards the vocal cords and not straight down into their mouth. The next thing I like to talk about is the sniffing position. It's where the head is slightly forward and slightly uh, um, rotate it backward posteriorly. This helps align the axes of the oropharyngeal airway. As you can see, I have a crude diagram of the patient's uh, anatomy. With the trachea, it goes from the sternal notch to the tracheus of the ear. As you can see, in a normal supine patient, this is slightly posterior. In patients that are more obese, um, and have a large fat pad that's going to be even more posteriorly directed. The mouth kind of goes straight back, and the nasal is in a more um, caught in direction as well. So putting it in the sniffing position helps align these axes and improve your visualization of the uh, lar laryngeal structures. One benefit that can be seen, especially in obese patients, is ramping the patient. This is done usually at about 30 degrees, but what you're trying to do is line the tragus and the sternal notch up and make them horizontal so that it's no longer posteriorly directed. If you allow the head to have some extensions, it also helps line these axes up so there's better view of laryngeal structures. Bag mass ventilation. Bag mass ventilation is important for saving patients' lives not a failure to secure an airway by tracheal intubation that patients die from. It's hypoxia that patients die from. So if you're able to ventilate the patient effectively without the use of an ET tube, the patient will still do fine. Bag mass ventilation involves placing the mask circumferentially on the bridge of the nose, because this is where most of your air leak will occur and placing it on the patient's, uh, around the patient's chin. Uh, when doing back mass ventilation, it's important to lift the jaw up into the mask as opposed to pushing the mask straight down the patient's face. When you push the mask straight down the patient's face, you push all the soft tissue structures back, including the oral pharynx. It's important to have your pointer finger and your thumb past midline so you're able to get a good seal on the other side of the patient's face because that will be the second place you have a leak. For single hand ventilation you can see my fingers are grabbing the mandible and my pinky is trying to grab the angle of the mandible. For people with small hands this might be more difficult. However this will help you to lift the patient's face into the mask and get a good seal. You're then able to mask ventilate the patient usually, and giving about 10 breaths a minute would be close to physiologic and would not cause hyperventilation. For patients who you have difficulty mass ventilating, either from having a large neck, having posterior uh, secretions, abnormal anatomy, single hand ventilation might be not enough to ventilate the patient. A rescue way of ventilating a patient is a two-handed technique. You'll take the thumbs 
and put it on the side of the mask at the top. Then you'll use your pointer and your middle finger to grab the angle of the mandible. This utilizes your three strongest fingers in clearing the obstruction of the patient's face. Some people like to do a double C, which then they're using their pinky or their ring finger to lift up on the patient's face, and they're not giving adequate jaw lift to open up the posterior structures. This will dedicate the most amount of your effort to opening up the airways. You'll then have to have an assistant, such as a respiratory therapist or a nurse, mat to squeeze your bag while you are holding uh, the mask to the patient's face and doing jaw lift at the same point in time. Placing an oral nasal pharyngeal airway can be important to helping assist in bag mass ventilation. The nasal trumpet can be placed in an awake patient, and my preferred technique is to have the curve go with the nasal septum until you have slight resistance. At that point in time, you want to rotate the curve, caudal, and it should fall down into the oropharyngeal airway. The length of the nasal trumpet should go from the patient's nostril down to the patient's tragus, and then you want the tip to be past the angle of the mandible. This is the distance that the the nasal trumpet will have to pass to open up the posterior oral pharynx. As you can see, for this patient, this nasal trumpet is probably a little short. The one caveat to that is patients who have had um, facial reconstructive surgery, where they've had such as a nose job or previous trauma or anything that might weaken the nasal septum, having the curvature going along the nasal septum could potentially go through the nasal septum. In those patients, it was probably better to go with the curvature straight caught at all the way back, and then if you have resistance, slightly uh, wiggling uh, the nasal trumpet to pass the back of the posterior pharynx. There's many approaches to placing an oral pharyngeal airway. The distance, the size of the oral pharyngeal airway should go from the incisors to the tragus to the angle of the mandible. For this is the distance that you need to traverse to open the posterior pharynx. My preferred technique is to grab the base of the tongue with a tongue depressor and then gently slide the oral pharyngeal airway along your tongue depressor. This ensures that the tongue remains forward and does not push back by the oral pharyngeal airway. After you've placed the nasal pharyngeal airway or oral pharyngeal airway, you then may begin mass ventilating again. An alternate technique that patient that providers sometimes use to place the oral airway is to having the C shape facing cephalad and then rotating it forward. When I have observed this in practice, frequently people, providers will push the tongue back in the oral pharynx. It makes the positioning of the oral pharyngeal airway ineffective. I have seen people bruise the back of the soft palate by not being gentle, and most people struggle with placing the oral pharyngeal airway in an effective manner. Placing an LMA is important. This is usually a rescue ventilation technique. There is hundreds of different ways to placing it. If you do not place them frequently, I recommend doing something that is more familiar for you. If you are currently using a tongue depressor to place an oral pharyngeal airway, I would do the same thing for an LMA, as you could consider an LMA an advanced oral pharyngeal airway. I would grab the base of the tongue, the slide the LMA, over the oral the tongue blade, straight into the oral pharynx. As this being a simulation, it is sometimes difficult to place an LMA. With the LMA, you then inflate the cuff and then you can resume bag mass ventilation. There's a couple things you'll have to troubleshoot with placing an LMA. The most likely problem you will encounter is the LMA 
will flip on its back. To demonstrate, I'll show you outside the patient's uh, face. Most likely what has happened is this will flip in this place, like this. And when you inflate the cuff, you're able to get a seal. If you're having difficulty getting a good seal, you may have to stick your finger in the back of the patient's mouth and try to flip the LMA into the correct position. And you may have to readjust the amount of air in the cuff. The next most common problem is you have not gone around the base of the tongue, that you have pushed the tongue so it sticks between the LMA and the vocal cords. To fix this, you may stick your finger in the patient's mouth and pull the tongue forward so the LMA sits more posteriorly in the patient's oropharyngeal oral pharynx. And these are the two most common things uh, that cause problems. Other maneuvers you might have to make is placing more or less air in the cuff. You may have to rotate the LMA or pull it slightly in or forward. Uh -huh. The size of the LMA is based on L ideal body weight. A size 4 is for a patient with ideal body weight of 50 to 70 kilograms. Size 3 is for smaller patients. Size 5 is for larger patients. You may have to try a different size LMA. Direct laryngoscopy is an advanced airway technique for securing the airway. First of all, I'd like to mention that I put my ET tubes in a C-shape. This is because this is the natural way it will sit in the patient's mouth after you're done performing laryngoscopy. As you can see, the trachea is up here, the oral pharynx will proceed back, and the mouth will come out here. This is the position that the ET tubes come in their package. For more anterior airways, I simply put a more uh, significant C-curve in my ET tube. The reason I do this is because when people put the ET tube in a hockey shape, you have a severe bend here, which I frequently have seen when the, when the stylet is removed, it brings the ET tube out of the airway and then sometimes you have an unintentional esophageal intubation. By leaving it in a C-shape, you reduce the amount of resistance when pulling the stylet out of the ET tube. Laryngoscopy uh, is performed by the patient with supine. The MAC blade is a curved blade. In this one, you can see the portion here is removed. Most MAC blades actually have it coming straight back. This is important to denote because if you move like this with the handle, you can see how this would knock out front teeth. It's important when per performing laryngoscopy to move in a single unit with the handle going to the upper corner of the room. Also, you will notice when you turn like this, it does not improve your view. You are only changing where the top of your view is on the length of the laryngoscope so it will not actually improve your view. The most important thing for laryngoscopy is opening the mouth wide. I, use this, I usually do this by scissoring. I put my right pointer finger on the upper molar and my thumb on the bottom canine. And you want to drop the rinchoscope blade all the way to the back of the mouth. And male adults, I usually have to almost hub the blade in the patient's mouth for female adults, I usually have come out a centimeter or so. It's important for the tip of the laryngoscope to sit in the molecula. If the MAC blade does not sit in the tip of the molecula, you will not be able to lift the epiglottis to get an adequate view. It is also important at this point in time to have swept the talk, either with placing the laryngoscope blade or now. That is the, the reason there is a wall on the side of the MAC blade. If you do not sweep the tongue, you will lose a half centimeter to a centimeter of your view and could make the difference in slightly more difficult patients. You will then lift towards the corner of the room and you will look down the patient's oral pharynx. And then once you see the vocal cords, you will place the ET tube through the vocal cords. Using a bougie, 
is an important way to potentially rescue patients that are more difficult uh, than the average patient. Mabuji comes in a container and a straight line. This is not how it was intended to be used. This is because this is easier to package and you can fit more bougies in the same box that you ship to um, institutions. Once again, you should curve the bougie so that it is the same shape that you would normally see in the patient's oral pharyngeal pharynx. For patients that are more anterior, you should put more of an anterior bend in it. With the bougie, you should perform direct laryngoscopy the same way. You then can use the bougie and place it, you can see the vocal cords through the vocal cords, or in a midline fashion towards the upper oral pharynx. Confirmation of, two, of bougie placement uh, can be felt with vibrations when going down the tracheal rings and also about 27 centimeters will lodge itself in the right main stem and not go any further. If, it, if after 27 centimeters it has not lodged itself in the right main stem, you are probably in the esophagus. Now the most frequent mistake I have seen with bougie placement is after the bougie is in the trachea, the provider will take the laryngos, the laryngoscope, out of the mouth. The laryngoscope needs to lay in the mouth to keep the epiglottis and the base of the tongue off the AT tube when you advance it down the bougie. With the bougie in the trachea, it will not advance if you place the AT tube over it. You want to advance the AT tube, and if possible, by direct visualization, advance the AT tube through the vocal cords. In adult males, it is usually safe to have the ET tube down to 23 centimeters at the teeth, and adult females down to 21 centimeters. After the ET tube is placed, you can remove the laryngoscope, hold the bougie, or hold the ET tube, and pull the bougie out over the ET tube. The most common problem pe people experience is the bougie will not advance over the arytenoids into the trachea. This is usually because it is stuck in the retinoid and the retinoid just bends when the AT tube is pushed. To overcome this, pull the AT tube back until it's no longer the retinoid, turn the AT tube 180 degrees, and then advance. As you can see, the AT tube has a bevel on it, and so by turning 180 degrees, a different point of the AT tube will contact the retinoid and it should advance uh, smoothly into the trachea. The last technique I would like to discuss is video laryngoscope. My favorite video laryngoscope is the Glidescope. And this is because it's a different technique than the direct laryngoscopy. The CMAC uses a similar blade to the MAC blade and has an angled scope on it, which improves your visual view, but it does not give to you an alternate technique to securing the airway. The Glidescope is not a Mac 3 blade, it is an angled blade that gives a different angled view and should not be treated as a Mac blade. The Glidescope is inserted midline, far on the base of the tongue, and you just rotate it into position. The, gl the Glidescope blade should be adjusted for patient size. Once you have seen the vocal cords, you will then come with an ET tube with a Glidescope stylet in it, and you will watch the ET tube pass through the mouth till it gets the base of the tongue. The biggest mistake providers make is they will watch the video screen while they're placing the ET tube, and they will either not be able to enter the oropharynx, or they will take biopsies of the side pilot or the tonsils with insertion of the ET tube. You would like to stay midline and then adjust your handle to facilitate placing the ET tube through the vocal cords.